In the small town of Westport, Connecticut, a drone is scanning for COVID-19 symptoms. And the reaction here is, well, mixed. Police have been flying drones here since 2016 for everything from traffic management to search and rescue. And they can use them to spot and warn people who are gathered too closely. But now, Dragonfly, the company that makes the drones, claims they can also detect whether you're running a fever, sneezing, or coughing heavily, all through a single camera flying 40 feet overhead. Subtle differences are on like a millimeter type of basis. So if somebody's coughing, you know, like this or like this, it's actually quite, quite a different type of uh, cough actually that they're detecting. The police chief says this partnership could help the town reopen and they need every tool possible. In a pandemic, we'll see the elevated temperatures, we'll, we'll see the increase in blood pressure, we'll see the flushed skin. So to have the technology available for future incidents, whether it be COVID related or something else that comes our way, I think we need to prepare for that. This is the first time Americans have been scanned for symptoms in this way, and there are skeptics. I don't know that this technology could distinguish between somebody with COVID-19 and somebody with influenza. I'm inclined to doubt it. Not to mention that many infected people never exhibit obvious symptoms. And even if it does work, are we ready to be scanned from the air? The involvement of the police makes me more worried about how this technology might have what we sometimes call function creep, in that it is used and designed for one purpose, but then it gets repurposed for other things. Do you believe that we're going to have to strike some kind of necessary compromise with the desire for privacy in order to get out of this thing? Public health uh, has built into it the need sometimes to invade people's privacies. The chief says it's all just research, but the police will see and save everything. By no means will we single out an individual and say, hey, look, you're, you're, you look like your temperature is elevated. Will you be hanging on to data that Dragonfly is collecting, or does that somehow go around you? Any missions, so to speak, that we fly with our drones, we keep those records. The ACLU of Connecticut responded this week saying that any new surveillance measure that isn't being advocated for by public health professionals and restricted solely for public health use should be promptly rejected. Is this the kind of thing we'll have to use in order to gather in public again? Do we really want to be entering into convention centers if they don't have a health monitoring system that can give us an indication or a reading of what is the potential risk? Keep a safe distance of six feet from others. There's the side of me that I say, this is very science fiction. I feel like I've seen this movie. I feel the same way, but at the same time, it's reality. It's our new reality. In the sky above North Carolina, the state famous for being first in flight, another aviation breakthrough as long-range delivery drones are called in to help in the fight against COVID-19. The company Zipline, whose drones have been dropping emergency blood transfusions in remote Rwandan villages for years, now working with Novant Health Systems to get emergency supplies to hospitals in a matter of minutes at the drop of a parachute. Two routes planned so far, with more possible in the future. Zipline drones can fly 100 miles, so it's 50 mile radius. If you think about a drone flying a 50 mile radius, 50 miles in all directions, that's 8,000 square miles. In Florida, drones flying for UPS are helping deliver medication from CVS to retirement communities, while Google's wing drones lowering food, coffee, and groceries from the sky. Here we go. On the ground in some medical facilities, the dangerous job of sanitizing left to automatic arms immune to any disease. And while humans keep their social distance, more robots with wheels are going the extra mile. Driverless cars like these from Neuro offering contact-free delivery, making pharmacy and supply runs in Texas. Here in LA, food delivery giant Postmates sending yellow droids like this out for drop-offs. And fleets of what are called starships that became popular on some college campuses before the pandemic struck, now retooled to deliver to neighborhoods sheltering in isolation. A future among robots getting closer as us humans stay apart. I have a doctor's note. These days, what goes on your face seems to be on everyone's mind. You are nuts wearing that mask for a 99%. Oh, but a growing body of research shows face masks may help slow the spread of coronavirus. At the University of Illinois, scientists use a device that generates high velocity droplets similar to the breath coming out of someone with COVID-19 to test how various household fabrics perform as masks. They found two layers and three layers of t-shirt fabric are highly effective at blocking droplets when you cough, sneeze, or talk. We don't have to rely on masks being made from a company or a factory from another country. Uh, we all have it at our home.
it shows that the masks that you need are accessible. We all have a shirt. We all have a t-shirt. Overseas at the University of Edinburgh in Scotland, researchers tested masks using a mannequin connected to a cough simulating machine. These images show the airflow when someone breathes or coughs without a mask, and this is the airflow with a mask. The research finding masks extremely effective at preventing forward airflow, though for some, air can escape from the back and sides. And some of these masks, the ones that weren't tightly fitting around the mouth, there was a backward jet. And these can actually, um, we have to be really careful when we're not wearing properly fitted masks. Both the Illinois and Edinburgh studies have not yet been published in a medical journal, but add to research already showing masks can work. Like this study, which found mandatory mask wearing in 15 states in Washington, D.C., possibly averted up to 450,000 COVID cases over the course of nearly eight weeks. Experts say one thing is clear. What's your message to folks out there regarding masks? Wear masks, even if they're handmade, they have a significant impact on the potential spread of COVID. Advice from those trying to uncover the science behind the mask. Companies across the nation are looking for new ways to protect consumers and employees. At Amazon, distance assistant technology allows staff to see if they are keeping their social distance and when they don't. Now, view how crowded the train is. In New York, the Long Island Railroad lets commuters find empty trains on its app, allowing them to space out with an entire market of products, from hygiene hooks to open doors to wearable hand sanitizer dispensers. Your employer and even your local theater will likely be required to take new safety measures to protect you. As more Americans return to work, they'll be greeted with reminders to keep their social distance. Some offices may even take their temperatures before they walk through the front door. Tonight, new rules and a new reality as we all face living in a pandemic. In an age where 9 out of 10 smartphones in America are either an iPhone or an Android, Apple and Google are now in a unique position, developing a new way to help track the health crisis called contact tracing. The two tech titans are reworking their operating systems, turning Bluetooth into a tool for measuring proximity, so you may know if you've been exposed to the virus. Apple and Google are really the only two companies in the world that can make this kind of Bluetooth tracking possible. How does it work? Two people come into close contact, six feet or less, for a sustained and unspecified period. Their phones send out keys or beacons that help identify the users anonymously. When they go their separate ways and later one person tests positive for COVID-19, that patient uploads his or her confirmation and all of the keys connected with that phone are alerted. You may have differences Kevin Esveld has been working where... on privacy-first contact tracing at MIT. His app, Safe Paths, will work with the new system. What are the most important things that need to be in place if it's going to be privacy-centric? To me, the single most important aspect is that it has to be distributed. It has to be decentralized. There needs to be no single location that has the information on who came in contact with whom, because that can be too easily abused by a government in particular. Apple and Google line out their privacy protections clearly. Explicit user consent is required. They don't collect personally identifiable information or user location data. And the list of people you've come into contact with never leaves your phone. But privacy concerns still remain a pivot point. A lot of people don't like it from the standpoint of uh, constitutional rights. The San Francisco-based Electronic Frontier Foundation examines the intersection between technology and privacy. The biggest thing I'm worried about is that whatever we put into place right now would stick around after the crisis has ended. Countries like China, South Korea and Israel have also used contact tracing effectively, though experts say without the same attention to personal privacy placing even more scrutiny on the novel efforts here. If built correctly, this could be a very powerful defense against all pandemics, because this is not just about COVID-19. COVID-19 is terrible. It's a tragedy. Historical pandemics have been worse. In the first pilot program of its kind, New York City's MTA is testing these ultraviolet lights to zap coronavirus on its trains and buses. It's been known for more than 100 years, in fact, that UV light is incredibly efficient at uh, killing uh, both viruses and bacteria. These UV rays are so strong that disinfecting will happen when the trains are out of service without passengers. Research shows the virus can live on a subway seat for up to 72 hours. Weeks ago, this system began shutting down overnight for deep cleaning. This is the next step. 
critical to reopening the economy, experts say, is assuring passengers that transportation is safe, both underground and in the air. More airlines are announcing new safety measures. To enforce social distancing, Delta will limit planes to 60% capacity and add more flights if needed. Today, United announced it's teaming up with Clorox and the Cleveland Clinic to deploy electrostatic sprayers, disinfectants, and wipes at its hub airports, as well as mandatory face coverings and touchless kiosks. On the road to recovery, Uber drivers are also installing plexiglass dividers to stay safe. So are some bars and restaurants. And this Miami-based company is cranking out a drop-down plastic shield, like a projection screen. They're presenting it to schools, to hospitals, to banks, anybody that has a reception area. In the war against COVID-19, the new weapons are clear. As cities go into quarantine and schools shut down across the country to help fight the spread of coronavirus, our houses and apartments are becoming a new kind of home base. With stay-at-home orders the new norm, video conferencing has become the gathering place for those of us craving a social connection. A place for birthday parties when we can't get together. Happy birthday! Happy birthday. Happy birthday. A welcome window into the weddings and celebrations we suddenly can't attend. Even the room where future doctors find out where they've matched for residency. At the center of this new reality is Zoom, a nine-year-old video conferencing platform that was originally built for business meetings. This month, it's been downloaded almost two and a half million times in the U.S. alone. More than Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat, and TikTok this week. Hey, Eric. Hi. CEO Eric Yuan founded Zoom. He never imagined his video conferencing startup would become the source of so much joy in a public health crisis. <laughs> It's become a part of the way that we socialize. What do you think all this says about where we are as a society right now? I think that the community society is going to become much stronger. And the tools like Zoom, we, we know that much better than just the audio conferencing because we can see each other. That has catapulted Zoom into the mainstream, joining well-known competitors like FaceTime, Skype, and Google Hangouts. It's features like changing the background. How about this one? are a hit with Generation Z. And in the future, I truly believe the video conferencing like Zoom can even deliver a much better experience. If you are drinking a coffee, we can digitize the smell. And from my side, I even can enjoy the smell as well. And it's not just Zoom. Skype says calls between its users have jumped 134%. With so many people logging on from home, all this video conferencing and work is also raising new questions about how much the Internet can really handle. Netflix, YouTube, Amazon and Apple recently decided to reduce the quality of their streaming services in Europe to help handle the demand, a move that hasn't happened here in the U.S. yet. But there has been a surge. In hard-hit Seattle, Internet usage has skyrocketed 40 percent since the coronavirus started spreading. But FCC chair Ajit Pai doesn't think the spike will break the Internet or slow it down. Is the Internet capable of handling all of this traffic and demand? Thus far, it appears to be. And part of the reason is instead of going from point to point, for example, as the old telephone system did, the Internet routes traffic uh, according to the path of least resistance, so to speak, so that if there's congestion in one path, uh, the Internet tr can shift that traffic to another path. Cheers! And that's good to hear as we depend on the Internet to keep us together while we're apart. Cheers.